Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Um, so I noticed uh, uh, during the Rick's lecture that when you guys asked questions, it was difficult for me to hear. And as he mentioned during his lecture, um, I want this to be interactive. I will ask you guys questions intermittently to, to force some interaction. Um, but uh, please interrupt me and maybe you guys need to shift up to the first row that I see is empty right in front of Becky so that maybe I can hear you. I'm not sure where the microphones are. Um, but please, just I won't be able to see you guys when I start the presentation. I'm going to just be able to see just my slides. So if you do have a question, just speak up, and I will um, gladly um, take the question. As Rick said, it's perfectly okay if I don't get through all the slides. I have about 22 slides. Um, I'd rather um, address your questions so that we are all uh, sort of on the same page. All right. So hopefully now you can see my title slide. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so the goal uh, for my lecture today is really sort of uh, two prong. One is I want to give you guys a sort of really mostly a big picture a view of plant cell biology as it relates to mechanical biology. I know that uh, many of you are uh, unfamiliar, perhaps uh, haven't thought about plants or seen plant cells uh, since high school. Uh, if at all, um, and so I want to really introduce you to plant cells, uh, what they are uh, made up of, not in detail, um, so you'll see very few nouns, and I'm not going to go into a lot of protein names and, um, and detailed uh, sort of structural elements, but give you a big picture uh, understanding, hopefully, of uh, how plants, uh, what plant cells consist of, what their major mechanical components are, and a little compare and contrast a little bit to animal cells, um, so you have a little bit of a feel for similarities as well as uh, distinctions. And since the center is focused on uh, growth uh, and, and sort of processes taking place during interphase as opposed to cell division, uh, I'm going to present this lecture and the information from the lens of cell growth or expansion and, and morphogenesis. So how do cells grow and, or expand and how do they acquire shape? Um, so that's going to be the conceptual framework uh, within which I'll talk about the plant and animal elements. Um, so let me start off right off the bat by just some uh, sort of very basic level comparison of the major mechanisms that drive morphogenesis now in this case of the body plant. Uh, so morphogenesis of animals versus morphogenesis of plants. Um, to sort of cue you to some important differences. So in, in our bodies, in, in animals, we have lots of different cell types. So there are hundreds of different cell types that perform different functions, have different morphologies that are important for those different functions. Um, and to generate this body plan, of course, there's a very elaborate genetic program involving, uh, you know, there's also biochemistry is very important in terms of hormones and other kinds of signaling. Uh, factors and morphogen gradients, etc., that uh, inform morphogenesis. Um, at a cellular level, cell migration is uh, is very important. Um, you know, I'm, hopefully, you guys have all seen movies of gas relation or something like that, where the cells are migrating uh, in mass, uh, uh, you know, on mass, and, and it's important for uh, uh, the embryo development, neuro tube formation, etc. And also apoptosis, or programmed cell death, is very important. So a good example of that is the, uh, uh, you know, the formation of digits, where you know the cells between your fingers die in a programmed, controlled manner to then, for, you know, give rise to the digits that we use as fingers or, or toes on, uh, on, our, uh, on our legs. So cell migration and apoptosis are critical elements for animal morphogenesis. Now this is in contrast to plants where one big difference is we have a, a lot fewer different cell types. So the repertoire of cell types in plants vary, you know, it's some in the range of 30 or so different cell types. Uh, again, they have different morphologies. You'll see a few examples in my lecture today. But importantly, this is what I want to emphasize here, there is no cell migration okay, in, in land plants at least. Uh, the, and that's because the cells are surrounded by a very rigid or tough cell wall that, you know, is uh, basically then precluding the ability of cells to migrate. So cells are landlocked or wall-locked to 
potential. They cannot lose. And also apoptosis, while it occurs, um, for example, during senescence, when leaves fall, during the fall, um, it is not a, a really important process from a morphogenesis perspective. So one way to sort of to summarize this is that we can think of the the shape of animals, uh, such as uh, the one shown here, you know, Leonardo's famous Vitruvius man picture. Uh, there's a history, essentially, a record of cell division events, um, cell migration events, and, and apoptosis, where and when apoptosis happens. In contrast, the shape of a plant, such as this Arabidopsis plant, so a very popular plant model system, uh, sort of the mouse of the plant world, you'll see here a lot about Arabidopsis during uh, boot camp and uh, the retreat. Um, so the shape of the plant is a history primarily of cell division, so when and where cell division occurs in the plant, and cell expansion, and particularly this is the direction or the axis of cell ex expansion and the extent or degree of cell expansion. So keep that in mind as we, as we go along. Um, as you just heard from Rick, and you'll hear more uh, from others uh, in days to come, uh, in a nutshell, some of the key elements that are important for shaping animal cells are the cytoskeleton, be it the actin cytoskeleton, as shown here in this uh, very famous picture of uh, looking at the actin meshwork, the branched actin structure in a lamellopodium. So this would be a, like a fish keratocyte or fibroblast, any kind of migratory cell. And here is the lamellopodium in, sort of in this greenish bluish color. And if we were to look at, look at that uh, using electron microscopy, you see a very dense um, sort of branched actin network that polymerizes uh, or grows, that network is, is growing in, in polymer length, uh, facing the plasma membrane, so that growth uh, or polymerization of the actin filaments is exerting force on the plasma membrane, extending that membrane forward. Right? So that's the protrusive force. Um, cell adhesion, as you heard uh, from Rick, involving uh, integrins and uh, focal adhesion uh, formation. Um, et cetera, is also very important for getting cells to adhere, and then there's also retractive forces uh, that involve actin and myosin and, and other elements that is uh, also playing a role in, in the motility and in, uh, uh, also uh, as part of cell shaping. So we can think of the basic mechanisms shaping animal cells as kind of cytoskeleton uh, uh, eccentric Forces. The forces are the pushing forces or pulling forces that are exerted via the cytoskeleton system and cell adhesion systems um, that dictate this process. We will see today what I'm going to talk about is really how um, this is different in plant cells. And as you will see as the, as, as, uh, during the course of today's lecture, is that the cytoskeleton in plant cells is important for shaping cells, but it plays an indirect role. So in animal cells, it is directly exerting pushing or pulling forces, thus transforming or altering cell shape. In plant cells, we will see the cell wall organization that's the key determinant or the key factor, and that happens through the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is very important, but it has an indirect role. Um, so to sort of orient you to this uh, 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 problem, um, so here are some key elements, I have like four bullets that are going to show up here um, uh, uh, that talk about the basics of, of plant cell growth. Okay. So one is the plant cell, one of the signatures really of the land plants is, is this cellulose rich cell wall. So plant cells, as I mentioned, synthesize their own cell walls. So this is different from the animal extracellular matrix in the sense that you have dedicated cells like fibroblasts, for example, that are secreting collagen or other uh, extracellular matrix components. In plants, each cell is synthesizing its own cell wall. So it's, it's, it's producing the wall that encases um, the cell. And cells are stuck to each other through their cell wall. Right? So the cell wall is a very strong material. You can see the elastic modulus of the cell wall it ranges uh, it is quite a bit, but it's in the high megapascals to sometimes gigapascals, depending on the cell size and the cell wall composition. 
Um, so you can imagine that growth of the plant cell is going to require something, a very strong force to sort of be able to expand um, the cell wall, to cause the cell wall to elongate. And the motive force for plant cell growth is turgor pressure, which is basically osmotic pressure that plant cells generate by accumulating ions and solutes. Um, and so the turbo pressure in growing cells can again be very high. Uh, you know, again in the sort of megapascals uh, uh, range. So this is uh, uh, you know two three times your tar uh, tar tire pressure uh, roughly. Or you can see as a comparison, our blood pressure is, is considerably lower compared to the turbo pressure that is uh, that exists in, in growing plant cells. And so we have turbo pressure, which is hydrostatic pressure pushing outward, right? So that's a outward force that is exerted by the protoplast, the, you know, which is essentially the plasma membrane and everything inside the plasma membrane, the cellular content. So that's why ions and solids are accumulating, primarily in the vacuole, and that leads to this very large turbo pressure that's exerting a force on the cell wall. Right? So it brings the cell wall to resisting that turbo pressure. So to grow, you need the turbo pressure, P, to exceed some threshold pressure, right? That's going to uh, uh, induce stress in the wall, and then the wall is going to irreversibly elongate, which is referred to as creep in, in the, uh, a lot of the mechanobiology literature. And you might hear that word used by Paul and others um, during boot camp. So we can relate these, uh, these ideas uh, using a simple equation, so this is uh, uh, called the Lockhart's equation, which is basically that the rate of volumetric growth, so that's the you know, dv to dt uh, uh, as a function of volume, um, is equal to the uh, difference in the, you know, basically the excess turbo, the turbo pressure that exceeds the threshold pressure, so that's the p minus pi factor, and a factor F that represents wall extensibility. So is the wall extensible or not? So if the wall is not extensible, then you can, you can imagine, you would imagine that the, the volumetric growth, the rate of volumetric growth is going to be low uh, for a given turbo pressure. Uh, and if the wall extensibility is very high, then you can enhance that uh, growth rate for any given turbo pressure. So you can already begin to see how plant cells can regulate uh, these uh, various parameters by controlling wall extensibility, uh, turbo pressure, etc. So, any questions so far? Somebody yell out yes or no. 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 Okay. So now, what I want to do is is have you guys do a, a little thought experiment. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so let's start out with a. Uh, a, 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 you know, a shape that represents a plant cell. So there's many plant cells, a lot of the ones that we study and a lot of people study, and then you'll see lots of pictures again and again and again, are roughly cylindrical cells. Okay, so if we look at a, a, a cylindrical plant cell, uh, we have this turbo pressure P, which is hydrostatic, so it doesn't inherently have any directionality. It's, it's the same in all directions. And so this turbo pressure is pushing, is exerting outward directing forces um, on this uh, plant cell, right? So as I said, turbo pressure is isotropic uh, on its own. So what do you think under these circumstances, given this cell shape that I've shown here, would the stress that this pressure is generating in the cell wall? So this would be tensive, uh, the cell wall would be under tension, right? As this Turbo is pushing outwards. So think of a balloon that you know you're uh, pumping with air or water, and uh, that's going to exert uh, 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 lead to stress uh, in the material making up the balloon, or in the case of the plant cell, the, the material making up the cell wall. Now, would the stress generated by turbo pressure also be isotropic, the same in all directions? No, because this cell wall uh, is cylindrical. So I couldn't hear that, sorry. No, because the cell wall is cylindrical. No, because the cell wall is cylindrical, that's, no is the correct answer, but the cylindrical cell wall should be more specific. So why is the, would, so here there's something to do with geometry, so maybe the non-biologists, some of the engineers can 
um, can add to that statement. Would you like to modify your statement? It would no be, is correct. It would be spherical if the, it was isotropic. So well, the, 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 the pressure is isotropic. So regardless of whether I do the cell as a sphere or as a cylinder, the turbo pressure is still uh, you know, pushing outward the same in all directions. I'm talking about the consequence of that turbo pushing on the wall. Would the stress experienced by the wall be the same, let's say, in the vertical direction along the axis of that cylinder as, as uh, uh, compared to the circumferential uh, direction, the horizontal direction? And no, so the radial pressure is going to be different than the, or the radial stress is different than the longitudinal stress. Correct, yeah, and that's a consequence of the geometry that I've drawn here, right? So the circumferential stress is roughly going to be, depending on the length of the cell, et cetera, about two times or so compared to the axial stress, right? So there's much more stress experienced or exerted on the, in, in the sort of horizontal or circumferential direction than in the axial direction. Um, and so given that, then, which direction would you predict, all things being the same, which direction would the cell expand in predominantly? Radially. Radially, right? That's what you'd expect. That's where the stress is higher. Um, and, but in most plant cells, that's not what happens. The cell instead expands axially, and that's because the wall extensibility is not isotropic. So the cell wall is reinforced differentially. So the brown uh, cable-like structures that you see in this picture represent cellulose microfibrils. So these are bundles of cellulose uh, uh, polymers uh, that are the predominant or sort of major structural element of the plant cell wall. And if the cellulose uh, filaments are oriented primarily in this circumferential manner, as I've drawn here, that is going to restrict expansion in that axis, and so the wall is more extensible in the axial direction. So although the stress is higher in the radial or, uh, direction, the wall is in fact more extensible in the axial direction because it is reinforced in the uh, radial direction. Okay, so the anisotropy or organization or asymmetry, however you want to think about it, of the cellulose microfibril organization is a major determinant of which axis, of the axis of cell expansion or cell growth. Is that, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, again, pretty straightforward concepts. So the main idea in terms of cell wall mechanics, controlling the growth axis, is if you have plant cells whose cellulose uh, microfibrils, here now showing those sort of uh, black lines, if the cellulose microfibrils are let's say, more or less randomly organized, then you will expect, and you'll see, roughly speaking, isotropic plant expansion, because there's no uh, bias or asymmetry in the wall mechanics. Uh, instead, now if the plants re uh, organize or arrange the cellulose microfibrils in an oriented manner, so that the net orientation, it is an absolute orientation, but the net orientation, let's say, is in this radial configuration, so now, the cells are essentially able to harness turbo pressure, the, uh, the driving force for growth, and lead to a directional cell expansion. So in this case, again, axial. Okay, that's basically the game that plant cells are playing in terms of determining their growth axis. Now, in reality, things are a little bit more complicated. So growth is really a combination of the plastic elongation of the wall. So this is irreversible elongation, right? So it's plastic, not elastic, like a rubber band, where you stretch the rubber band and the rubber band extends, and if you let go of that force, that stretching force, it will snap back. Cells don't do that. They grow irreversibly, so that's plastic elongation. So this is kind of like, you know, taking a plastic bag and stretching it, and it will stretch, but it doesn't go back. It remains stretched once you let go of it. So you have plastic elongation of the wall plus incorporation of new cell wall material that also happens during growth. So keep that in mind. We're not going to worry about the details today, but but there's more to it than just simply a plastic elongation of the wall. Ron, can I ask a question? Yeah. What are the materials that are becoming plastically elongated? 
Um, good question. I don't think we have a full understanding of that, but I will touch on that with the, I, I have a, a section on plant cell wall components and how expansion of the cell wall is thought to occur. So even in a nut, in, in a one sentence, uh, answer would be the, the uh, current, th the main thing for a long time has been that the cellulose microfibrils are interlinked through uh, uh, non-covalent interactions, and those linkages are broken to facilitate uh, expansion, which is plastic. Because those linkages, when broken, new cellulose is inserted and new linkages are made. So that's an irreversible process. So does that, does that help? Yes, thanks, but there's another question. Okay. What? What, so in, what initiates the anisotropy of the cell during development or like what? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about that next. So obviously that's the next big question, right? So I'm talking about all this anisotropy of the cell wall being really important for the question that becomes what generates that. And that is with the cytoskeleton, particularly the microtubule cytoskeleton is what's generating that. So that's why the cytoskeleton is playing indirect role. By patterning the cell wall material, that's how the cytoskeleton is determining the cell shape or the growth axis, as opposed to directly pushing on the plasma membrane. Because you can imagine the turbo pressure, as I showed, is in the megapascal range. That's enormously higher than the piconeutons level forces that the cytoskeleton can exert. So the cytoskeleton is working by affecting cell wall pattern of the cell wall material. And I'll walk you, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Any other questions? Is the material that's creeping and expanding, do you think that it's uh, there are mechanical crosslinks in the material, or is it a chemical crosslink? So when you do experience a creep, um, is there a, a, a bit of reversibility in there? Does the stress relaxation coming from the new cell wall material cause it to um, I guess re-entangle at a certain point, or are these things permanently strained to a more organized space? Uh, that's an excellent question. I, to be honest, I don't know the answer right off the top of my head. There is certainly some level of stress relaxation that can occur, um, but I think um, part of the issue, as you will see, is the cell wall material is, is polysaccharide rich, not as opposed to protein rich. So that has made it difficult to gain a, uh, although you'll see we have this, you know, people have learned a lot about cell wall structure and composition and microstructure, but the uh, polysaccharide chemistry and imaging and analysis is a lot harder than, than proteins where you can use genetics, uh, for example, uh, and other techniques more readily. Um, so I actually don't know that answer, and I will confer with some colleagues who are uh, experts in that arena and get back to you. So I'll send an email to you then. Okay, to go ahead? Yes. Okay. All right. So before I get to the side of skeleton, I just wanted to make one other point, which is that there are two kinds of, um, sort of types of growth that we can distinguish. Uh, one is called diffuse growth, essentially what we've been talking about so far. So imagine you have a cell, as shown here on the, on the left, uh, uh, and, with, and then you have marked the surface of the cell with some kind of you know, um, uh, uh, indelible mark, you know, ink spots or whatever. And if you watch the growth of that cell, uh, then you see diffuse growth is where the growth is happening roughly the same extent uh, uh, across the, the, uh, the cell surface. So these individual fiduciary marks um, you know, uh, separate the distance uh, or the separation between them is about the same along the entire length of the cell. So this is uh, how most plant cells are growing and expanding like the epidermal cells on the surface of the embryonic stem or the hypocaudile. Um, uh, very famously, the you know also in the root. So you have this small stem cell population in the root at the tip of the root that's giving rise to the cells that make up the root. And these cells undergo uh, elongation, uh, you know, mediated by these wall and uh, processes that I described. 
where the final cell size can be hundreds, sometimes even close to a thousand times the initial size. Um, and that's all the use growth. So this is how plant cells are grow growing in, in, in height or as the roots are, uh, are growing in, in length. In contrast, you also have tip growth, which also can, is, occurs in animal cells. So like rose cones or neurons um, are, are growing by tip growth. And here, the, as the name suggests, the growth is focused rather than being diffusely distributed uh, across the surface of the cell. It is focused to a particular point or tip um, so that now if you do the same kind of marking experiment, you see that along the shaft of the cell, the, there's no growth, but the growth is restricted to this uh, growing point uh, when new material is being deposited. Right? So this in plants, uh, in land plants at least, uh, the two predominant examples are pollen tubes. So the pollen when it germinates, it extends this tube-like structure that delivers the sperm cells for fertilization, and then the root hairs. So on the top here, I'm showing you just the root, but I'm sure you guys have all seen the fuzzy hairs on the surface of roots, and those are uh, uh, structures that are also generated via tip growth. Okay. Uh, so now getting back to the question that someone asked, which is, what is generating? What is responsible for creating this wall and hypertrophy? And that is awareness cytoskeleton, and particularly the microtubule cytoskeleton comes into the picture. Um, and so this idea is, has been, uh, is a pretty old idea, and this is a classic picture from Keith Porter's lab back in the 60s. And what we're looking at is a electron micrograph, so this is electron microscopy, uh, of a glancing section of a plant cell. So you can see a little piece of the cell wall, that's the one that's labeled here in EW, and beneath the cell wall would be the plasma membrane, which you can't see, and then beneath that are these rod-like structures, these tube-like structures, and these were then christened as microtubules. And in fact, this is one of the first pictures of microtubules that that for, uh, you know that was uh, published. So perhaps you guys can see this kind of filamentous nature of the cell wall itself. Uh, you know, these kind of very fine fiber-like uh, 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 fibers in the cell wall. And those are the cellulose microfibrils. So you can see that the orientation of the cellulose microfibrils mirrors the orientation of the microtubules uh, in the inside of the cell. Right? So these microtubules are attached to the plasma membrane, and their orientation is guiding the orientation of the cellulose. How does this work? Uh, we know a fair amount of the, uh, the key players mediating this, and again, I don't want to go into the details here, uh, but the basic idea is that the cellulose is synthesized by a very large enzyme complex called the cellulose synthase, um, or the cellulose synthase complex. That's the, the green uh, 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 complex of proteins here are depicted in this picture. So as uh, for all proteins that are either secreted or inserted into the plasma membrane, they have to go through the secretory system. So what is shown here on the bottom is the Golgi apparatus packaging of these cellulose synthase complexes, this enzyme complex um, in uh, the vesicles emanating from the Golgi complex. And uh, these vesicles then fuse to the plasma membrane adjacent to the cortical microtubules. That's this blue tube. Uh, like structure there. So the insertion of the cellulose synthase complex occurs adjacent to the plasma membrane. And when these cellulose synthase complex then start synthesizing cellulose and extruding that out outside of the cell, that's what these little black uh, cables here represent as cellulose being synthesized by the enzyme complex. Each enzyme complex is producing uh, roughly 20 to 30 or so um, cellulose fibers that coalesce to crystallization and, and form these cellulose cables. And when these enzyme complexes move during the process of this polymerization and, and uh, uh, extrusion process, they track along microtubules. So we know proteins that connect the cellulose synthesis complex to the microtubule. Right? So now you can see why the organization of the microtubule cytoskeleton is very important because the microtubule cytoskeleton is effectively acting as a template for the, that guides the, the motion, the direction of motion of the 
cellulose synthase complex. So if the microtubules are oriented predominantly in a radial uh, orientation, then that will result in cellulose microfibrils also being predominantly oriented in a radial manner, thus giving rise to this uh, axial elongation. And that's exactly what happens in these cells, whether they are the hypocardial cells or in your root cells. In these cells, if we were to look at the microtubule pattern, then you would see that the microtubules are uh, oriented in a radial uh, uh, direction, uh, and the cellulose would match. The cellulose orientation would be mirrored uh, similarly. Okay. So the microtubules that are indirectly uh, dictating cell shape by controlling the orientation of cellulose. Now we also think that the microtubule side of cellulose is um, mediating the oriented delivery of other cell wall materials like hemicellulose and pectins that I will get to in, in, in a little bit. Um, but since the cellulose microfibrils are the major load bearing element, so the tensile strength of cellulose microfibrils is quite similar to steel, um, as they are the major load bearing element, their organization uh, is, is how to dictate uh, the wall and isotopy. So you can imagine that as uh, similar to some of the drugs that Rick mentioned that people use to manipulate cytoskeletal uh, processes like the row systems in animal cells, if you disrupt the cortical microtubule uh, organization, either using a variety of drugs that affect microtubule uh, stability, or genetically by you know, uh, using mutants that affect microtubule uh, uh, behavior, then you can severely impact uh, plant cell morphogenesis and consequently, uh, consequently plant development. Okay. Um, now, interestingly, just like in animal cells, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the cytoskeletal systems here. You'll hear more about um, cytoskeletal biology uh, in Erica Holzbauer's lecture tomorrow. And the microtubule and acting cytoskeletal biology is, for the most part, highly conserved between plants and animals. There are a few differences. Um, but the bulk of the biology in terms of how these polymers are created and how they are organized uh, uh, and motor proteins that move along them, all of that is conserved between plants and animals. Here, what I want to emphasize is I just told you that the microtubule side of cells, the cortical microtubules that are attached to the glass membrane and serve as effectively tracks or templates along which these cellulose synthase complexes are going to move, um, is what's uh, important for gener generating the wall uh, mechanical anisotropy. Now, interestingly, the cortical microtubule array is very dynamic. Okay. Uh, one other point that I will make here, because you might hear this uh, uh, in, in Erica's lecture and also in other people's uh, talks uh, at the retreat, uh, plants don't have uh, an organelle called the centrosome, which is in many animal cells, like fibroblasts and other uh, proliferating cells, give rise to microtubules um, that uh, produce a radiating pattern, a radial array. Plants instead have a non-centrosomal microtubule array because there are no centrosomes. Uh, they're uh, absent in land plants. And so you get these linearly array arranged microtubules. And non-centrosomal microtubule arrays are also very important in many animal cells, such as neuro cells. So along the shafts of the axons or the dendrites, the projections uh, emanating from the neuro cell, the microtubules within those projections are non-centrosomal, uh, non-centrosomal, excuse me, and also linearly arranged. Same goes for muscle cells. You might see some of that in brain processor stuff, um, as well as epithelial cells. So non-centrosomal microtubule arrays are also playing an important role um, in animal systems. In plants, we uh, use GFP technology to do live imaging of microtubules. Um, and so this movie is just showing you one plant cell. We're focusing on a cell from a, uh, uh, an epidermal cell on the surface of an Arabidopsis stem. And we have labeled uh, the microtubules green by tagging the subunits that makes up microtubules called tubulin with GFP. 
and the red signal is the protein that labels the growing ends of the microtubules so they're easy to follow. So when I play the movie, you'll see that the microtubules are very dynamic. They're growing and shrinking, and you can see that they're not all oriented in, in this circumferential direction. You have microtubules that are also oriented in other directions. Um, and so this template that is dictating or guiding the orientation of cellulose and other cell wall material is a dynamic template. So this confers the ability to be, uh, uh, it confers responsiveness to the cell, right? So the cell can alter this template depending on its needs uh, and thus control um, the cell wall uh, and isotropy and therefore alter the growth axis of the cell. So as you can imagine, so basically, we can think of the cortical microtubule array as a, a morphogenetic template or a morphogenetic engine. So different cell types that have very different cell shapes. So we've seen these kind of roughly cylindrical cells that I've shown you so far here on the left of the picture of the seedling. So do, these would be the epidermal cells on the surface of the uh, hypocartile or on the surface of the root uh, down there. We have other uh, kinds of cells on the surface of leaves or cotyledons. Um, so these guard cells are these kidney bean shaped cells. So you can see a, radi a radial microtubule pattern here, or the pavement cells, which have a jigsaw puzzle piece shape, so they have a much more complex, so more net like microtubule pattern. The different cell types have different cortical microtubule uh, array structures that lead, uh, that are important for these different cell shapes. In addition to that, similar to animal cells, the plant cells can fundamentally or in a wholesale manner we uh, alter the uh, microtubule organization. So in a cell that is rapidly growing, microtubules tend to be transversely oriented, right? So the cellulose is oriented similarly, and now you have the cell grows lengthwise. When cells stop elongating, for example, uh, when, they can, you know, when a seedling goes from a dark brown state to light, for example, then these microtubules undergo a wholesale reorganization. So now they are longitudinally oriented, you know, 90 degrees, uh, uh, you know, uh, compared to the initial uh, orientation. So plant cells can modulate the microtubule architecture to control uh, growth. So this basically slide is summarizing what I've said so far, which is we have the cortical microtubules subtending the plasma membrane. They are attached to the plasma membrane along their length. And so the organization of the cortical microtubules then dictates the organization of the cellulose microfibrils, and we also think other cell wall material. And so that is how you uh, create this wall anisotropy um, that leads to directional expansion. So here, uh, worth reiterating the point that I've, one of the differences between animal and plant cells that I made early on. So in plant cells, the microtubule and also the actin cytoskeleton, which I'll get to in just a second very briefly, uh, does not serve as a direct supporting structure, right, where it's a, a skeleton, so to say. So not really functioning as a skeleton, but rather as a scaffold or a template. So it's more of an organizing framework uh, that's organizing cell wall deposition rather than directly supporting um, the, the plasma membrane uh, 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 shape. And so the key mechanical elements for plants are the cytoskeleton, particularly the microtubule cytoskeleton and the cell wall. So you can imagine that you know, all of the things that the cells can do control the cytoskeleton and the cell wall then therefore also become major uh, elements important from a mechanobiology standpoint. So uh, proteins that regulate the dynamics and the organization and lifetime of the cytoskeleton play a role in, uh, uh, in controlling the mechanics of plant cells. Similarly, all the mechanisms and processes and, and, and the proteins underlying uh, those mechanisms that control the composition, the synthesis, and the delivery of the various cell wall components. The arrangement of those cell wall components in 3D form the structure of the cell wall. And the extensibility, so proteins that regulate the extensibility of the cell wall, uh, are all important uh, players in the mechanical behavior of plants, in addition to cells being able to control pressure. 
So next, I'm just going to very briefly touch on PIP growth. Uh, diffuse growth is what uh, uh, we and, and other people in the, in the center work on for the most part for now, but there's a very interesting mechanobiology also related to PIP growth that I don't have time to go into. I just want to point out, just so you don't leave with the impression that the microtubule cytoskeleton is the end all and be all and the actin is not as important. Um, the actin is very important during diffuse growth as well. Uh, for other reasons that I'll show you on the next slide. But in tip growth, actin is the dominant cytoskeletal system. So you can eliminate the microtubular cytoskeleton using drugs uh, like cochicine and others that will depolymerize the microtubules. And tip growth will essentially be unaffected. But if you depolymerize the actin cytoskeleton, uh, then you stop tip growth. Right? So here we're looking at pollen tubes, which is a, a very popular model for tip growth. Um, so here we're looking at the tip of the pollen tube, and then that would be the shank uh, of the pollen tube. And if you stain for actin, you see these actin cables, and they are responsible for delivering uh, cell wall and membrane uh, components to uh, vesicle delivery in a focused manner to that tip, and that's what focusing the growth of these cells to that growing tip. So if you alter uh, the organization of the actin cytoskeleton, you can uh, alter the rate of tip growth as well as the directionality of tip growth. Um, in interface, in, in diffusely growing cells, cytoplasmic streaming is this process whereby you have, you know, the contents of the cytoplasm sort of swirling around quite rapidly, relatively speaking, is very important. This is powered by myosin, and so these are motor proteins that move along actin filters, motor proteins that move along Microtubules come in two flavors, kinesins or dynein. Uh, interestingly, plants also lack dynein, so plants only uh, have kinesins, and, and, that, and those are the motors that plants use to move things along microtubules. Uh, myosins are the motors that uh, uh, move material along the actin filament. Uh, in plants, the myosins uh, that do the power of this motility of these organelles, as you can see here, um, during cytoplasmic streaming, the myosins are called myosin 11. They're very similar to myosin 5, for those of you who are familiar with that. The, it, the names really don't matter for today's lecture. Um, but the plant myosins are, are easily the fastest known motors. And so some of these plant myosins move at velocities really actually not just 70, but up to 100 microns per second, uh, sort of blistering phases. Um, the median is rapid mixing of cytoplasmic. All right, so that, um, I'm going to now conclude with some uh, information about the cell wall, really touching on the major components of the cell wall and some aspect of their um, structure and extension, but only uh, very, very briefly. Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, just to let you know, Marcus Faustin will tell you more about cell wall and will probably, uh, you'll, you'll probably hear some of this again um, tomorrow's lecture, but I wanted to give you guys like, some uh, basic information just uh, because this is important in terms of the mechanical elements important for plant cell growth. So the cell wall is sort of, as I said, a defining feature really of, of plant plants. Very important for really all parts of the life and growth and development of plants, and also for commercial standpoint. Uh, so for you know thinking about innovations. Uh, or knowledge transfer in the center, you know, think about paper or fiber that we use, you know, like cotton, uh, wood, fuel, et cetera, et cetera, including biofuels. A lot of that is, is really cell wall biomass. We are talking about uh, wood in many cases. So the cell wall serves many, many important functions in the life of a plant. As I've described, it acts as an exoskeleton effectively that is providing rigidity and allows for this positive turbo pressure to develop, right? So it resists the turbo pressure um, uh, and the compliance of the cell wall is what you need for growth. Uh, in cells that conduct water in the plant, the cell wall actually needs to be further strengthened to withstand negative pressure or tension that develops in these water columns. Uh, the cell wall mechanical strength is, of course, very important 
not just for the growth of the cell, but also to support the, the weight of the plants. So imagine, you know, think of redwoods, all right? These trees that are incredibly tall, and that all of that is enormous weight uh, is, is, is being, uh, you know, to support that, you need a very strong material in, uh, in the form of the cell wall. Cell walls also glue cells together to form tissues and organs. So there's no cell motility. So cells basically, when you know, stay where they are, roughly speaking, uh, in in plant tissues and organs. Um, and so you don't have a relative movement of cells, well, you know, to each other, but you do have relative growth of cells, right? So with respect to one another. Um, cell walls also act as diffusion barriers, and as I've described, they determine uh, cell shape. So in terms of cell wall types that you will hear uh, uh, in various talks in the working groups and, and the retreat, you'll hear about primary walls. So these, as the name suggests, is the, the, you know, the wall that a new cell after division, after cell division, lays down. So this is formed by growing cells. They're relatively thin. And relatively, again, simple, although a simple is, you'll see, is, is really not that simple. It's very complex, um, uh, even in the primary cell walls, as I'll show you in just a few slides. But they are compliant. They are flexible enough to allow cell expansion. And that compliance is, is uh, conferred by specific enzymes that confer that extensibility. And I'll talk about those in, in also today. Um, secondary <laughs> cell walls are laid down after the cell has finished expanding or uh, differentiated cells. And they are much more complex, or so they're you know, much thicker, considerably thicker, compared to the primary walls. Um, they have a different composition um, that involves lignification that strengthens that wall even more. Uh, and they have multiple layers, and I'm not going to go into the details that differ in, in their width uh, or thickness, as well as in the orientation of the cellulose uh, microfibrils. Um, so these secondary walls, effectively, so wood is really all secondary cell wall. Right? So in this picture, if we look at the three cross section, what you're looking at primarily is secondary cell wall. If you look at a seedling or any other growing part of the plant, like a root, the cell wall is primarily, most of the cells have primary cell wall. So in terms of the major cell wall components, one of the big distinctions, so remember, each cell is producing a cell wall. Right? So every cell is, is producing a cell wall that is uh, encasing that cell. Another big difference compared to animal cells is that the cell wall, which we can think of as is in some ways the plant extracellular matrix, is polysaccharide based. Animal ECM, as you as you heard today, and you will hear tomorrow uh, uh, more from Becky, is primarily protein sources. So you have fibronectin, collagen, uh, and other kinds of protein uh, sources. Plant cell wall is also filamentous uh, uh, polymers, but polysaccharide polymers. So cellulose is the predominant uh, polysaccharide. <coughs> uh, certainly, the, the, the most uh, abundant biopolymer on Earth, um, and I'm not going to go into the details here. I have I will make these slides available to you as a PDF um, uh, today. You have this, and you'll hear much more about this from Marcus. So I'm just kind of laying down the groundwork here. Uh, besides cellulose, you have uh, polymers that are called hemicelluloses and pectins. These are much more so. Cellulose is a linear polymer, so glucose. Um, hemicelluloses and pectins are heterogeneous. There, you know, there are many different kinds of hemicelluloses and many different kinds of pectins based on what kind of sugars are coming together to form these structures. They also are branched uh, structures, uh, kind of like uh, uh, resembling only in terms of the branch form to, uh, uh, I'm speaking out here, what's the branched uh, 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 polymer that we have in muscles and, and uh, other tissues as our storage product that, that uh, is broken down by adrenaline. Can someone say Glycogen. that? Glycogen. I'm having a senior moment here. Glycogen? Yes, glycogen. Thank you. Um, I kept thinking collagen. I'm like, no, not collagen. Glycogen. Right. Um, so, hemicellulose and the pectins are branched polymers. Um, 
have mesoilosis. For a long time, people thought mediated linkage, uh, cross-linking between the cellulose microfibrils to form kind of a network structure that's been questioned uh, more recently. So um, things, you know, so our understanding might change. Uh, pectins, what's interesting about them also is that they are charged. They uh, uh, consist of a lot of negatively charged or acidic um, sugars, so they are water attracting and so the similar to protea glycans, they sort of are responsible for hydrating the cell wall. And kind of, you know, pectins you are all familiar with in jellies, right? Jellies and jams are jelly-like because of the pectins um, that uh, make that jelly-like consistency. Uh, lignins are what uh, kind of form almost exclusively in secondary cell walls. They are important for waterproofing the cell wall and, and further strengthening the cell wall, in addition to the polysaccharides like the cellulose, the hemicellulose, and the pectins, which together are like 90% of the mass of the cell wall. You have proteins that are by mass or weight, maybe 5 or 10% of the cell wall, but they are nonetheless very important from a structural standpoint. You know, some of these proteins that are hydroxychloroprolene rich or glycine rich, a structural protein, as well as from an enzymatic standpoint for wall assembly, as well as a uh, wall extensibility, breaking uh, 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 hydrogen bond connections or non-covalent connections uh, between cell wall components to for extensibility. Um, for certain cells, also lipids are important, like on the surface of the epidermis, you have a cutin or waxy layer uh, you know, that uh, uh, prevents water uh, evaporation from the leaf surface, for example. So here, I just have two more slides. Um, uh, I'm just looking at showing you some pictures just to show you to have a snapshot of what some of these polymers look like. So here we have cellulose, so linear uh, glucose uh, chains that interact with each other non-covalently to form these cellulose cables or microfibrils. These hemicelluloses and pectins, you see a branch structures consisting of not just glucose, but a lot of other kinds of monosaccharides. Some of them can be charged, as in the case of the pectins. Um, and so in the case of pectins, just like you might uh, hear for proteoglycans, because they consist of negatively charged sugars, they can be crosslinked through calcium ions, for example. And so cells can regulate the rigidity of the pectin network or the porosity of the pectin network by controlling whether these sugars um, exist in this uh, ionized form or they can be esterified, uh, de uh, esterified uh, with methyl groups and now they cannot be linked with calcium ions anymore. So you can break these linkages also. The lignin is, in contrast, a phenolic structure. So you see lots of aromatic residues and they are cross-linked covalently with by peroxidases to form the lignin that makes up the wood. Um, so this, you know, is just a cartoon, really, of cell wall structure. In some ways, it should remind you of the animal extracellular matrix, you know, where the predominant, the sort of the striking feature are the collagen cables. Here, the striking feature is the, are the cellulose cables, these big orange bundles here. And then they are enmeshed within this complex matrix of what are called matrix polypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolypolyp
But because you have a lot of different components that make up the cell wall, of course, you need all of these different components to be synthesized and delivered to the cell wall. Now, interestingly, the synthesis and delivery occurs in different parts of the cell uh, for different components. The cellulose is synthesized by the cellulose synthase complex that is inserted in the plasma membrane. In contrast, the hemicelluloses and the pectins and the cell wall proteins are all synthesized. You know, the hemicelluloses and the pectins are synthesized in the Golgi, and they have to be treated uh, by packaging them in these little packets called vesicles that then need to fuse with the plasma membrane and, and dump their contents into the cell wall. And then somehow these have to be incorporated in the cell wall in the correct way to build the appropriate cell wall structure. Cell wall loosening or extensibility, uh, the main idea here, this is my last slide, uh, is uh, breaking connections between cell wall polysaccharides be they connections between hemicellulosis and cellulose microfibrils, or connections between cellulose microfibrils themselves. There are a variety of enzymes that have been uh, shown to be important for this. Some, like these endoglucanases, that cut polysaccharides, so they break the covalent linkages and, and uh, fragment the polysaccharides. Others mediate other kinds of reactions, like take a part of one polysaccharide and fuse it to another. The most important and famous uh, cell wall loosening enzymes are called expansins. Uh, the mechanism of their action is still unclear, but the uh, uh, popular idea is that they break uh, uh, non-covalent interactions between cellulose uh, microfibrils uh, mediating creep. Uh, interestingly, these enzymes, these cell wall enzymes, are, uh, require acidic environment, and so the cell wall acidity, which is then in turn regulated by proton pumps, uh, becomes an important uh, 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 is an important part of uh, cell wall expansion, um, and certainly cell wall enzyme activity correlates with uh, growth as you expand as you expect uh, uh, if you need to generate extensibility. So yeah, I think that was that's my last slide. Um, so I'm happy to take some questions. I know uh, I'm a little I ran, I, I ran a little bit late, um, but if if people have more questions. Uh, beyond what we have time for now, feel free to email them to me and I'll, I'll get back to you. Thank you.